let's uh, open in prayer. Father, thank you very much for this time together. I pray that you would bless our uh, this lecture time. Thank you for the prospective students and pray that they would get a lot of uh, good um, information of how uh, the college uh, runs from this class. Thank you very much for uh, all of your many blessings to us in spite of this uh, uh, quarantine. And uh, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, so we postponed the field trip uh, for this Saturday. Again, it's not mandatory, but um, I will give you uh, instructions later. I'll probably uh, do a different location uh, than I did, um, I was planning on last week. So um, I will give you all the information you need to know at the um, end of the week, Thursday or something like that, and email it to you. Okay, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm grading your tests right now um, and just working through them slowly and we will see the outcome. Um, well, right now we've just begun our um, survey through the insects. We've done a lab on them and um, lecture. We're a little behind and so we will get a good review here and try to cover some of the um, other arthropods if I do get finished with the insects today. So um, let's get started. The, let's see, share screen. Dr. Wilson, real quick, I don't think this is being recorded. Um, okay. Should be that little button. Record uh, on this, there we go. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so we'll We'll start with insects. I, I think I got one slide in and um, the last lecture, and I will do a quick, a quick um, review of this first slide um, about insects. It's o over a million before I said pushing a million insects, but now it's over a million uh, species. Uh, the general body plan, as you know, is the head, thorax, and abdomen. The head's got antennae, compound eyes, mouth parts. Um, and then the thorax, remember, has pro, meso, meta, thoracic segments and a pair of legs on each segment, hence six legs. And one pair of wings on the meso, meta, thoracic segments, hence four wings. Um, abdomen, reduced or no paired appendages. And the cerci, which are little tiny, uh, well, usually pretty short, stubby looking things that um, look like rear end antennae, um, are on the back side of some insects, some more uh, obvious than others. Okay, um, here's just a, a generalized insect here. We've got, uh, again, the head and compound eyes, antennae, mandibles, labrum, ma just kind of know these collectively as mouth parts down here. The prothorax, the mesothorax, and the metathorax. And then you would call these the what, gang? Anybody? The what? Prothoracic legs. Prothoracic legs. Mes oops, uh, mesothoracic legs and metathoracic, metathoracic <laughs> legs. We've got an ovipositor. That simply means an egg layer, which is at the tip. It's obviously a female. Uh, egg laying uh, equipment. Uh, and then Circe, they don't have that labeled here. All right. So that, again, is a, a quick overview of the external anatomy. I had mentioned that they have spiracles. These little holes here on the side of the abdomen are spiracles. They are breathing holes. There's also a couple of spiracles on the thorax 
usually situated between these, uh, between the pro and the meso, and the meso and the meta, there's a, a couple spiracles here. And that sort of as an entryway into um, the body of a bunch of air tubes that run to all the tissues of the body to deliver atmospheric air um, to all of the tissues and gas exchange occurs. That's pretty impressive. So you can dunk an insect's head underwater and never drown it. All right. Uh, metamorphosis. Yeah. I was wondering, um, so is, are the spiracles like the, it's not a terminology, but, but are the spiracles the only way that it breathes or will it also breathe through, through regular lungs as well? No, no, uh, no lungs, just spiracles. Again, uh, it, it's basically spiracles are opening into a system of trachea, um, like our trachea. And they divide, just like our trachea, into bronchi, bronchioles. Bron they're not called that, but sort of like branching. So their whole body is a lung. Um, so like and so the alveoli, they're not called alveoli, but when you finally get to the end of the uh, branching airways, they're called tracheoles, not, uh, not alveoli. And the tracheoles are terminating into the tissues where there's gaseous gas exchange of oxygen and CO2 uh, right at the tissues. No oxygen delivered by the blood. Okay, metamorphosis. This is a, uh, a big characteristic of a lot of arthropods. Uh, many arthropods, um, well, I should say insect metamorphosis can either be no metamorphosis um, where basically, um, and then you've got the incomplete metamorphosis and the complete, and we'll, we'll talk about each in turn. No metamorphosis means that basically the insect, uh, this little dot here is an egg, and it hatches into a, um, a uh, larva, okay, and then it it eventually gets to a point where it has to molt and, or shed. So it sheds its skin and molts into a bigger larva. And then um, after a while, it, it can't grow because the insect cuticle or exoskeleton does, is not cellular, so it cannot grow. It can stretch a little bit, just like your clothes can stretch. But after a while, if you're growing, you're say in junior high, your clothes may stretch a little bit, but after a while, uh, you need to uh, get new clothes. And the insect is faced with that same dilemma. They, they basically have to secrete uh, a new exoskeleton underneath the old. That would be like you, as I know this is a crazy uh, uh, mental image, but secreting your new clothes underneath your old clothes. But your new clothes have to be bigger size than your old clothes. They're bigger, but they're underneath the old. So that means they have to be laid down in folds or wrinkles by the epidermis. The epidermis is one cell layer, not like ours. Um, and their epidermis secretes the cuticle. And then once they've secreted the new cuticle underneath the old cuticle, then they uh, inflate, uh, usually by taking in air through their spiracles and sort of do the Incredible Hulk thing and rip out of their old exoskeleton or cuticle and then their new cuticle is much more plastic and much more stretchy. It's not been, it hasn't uh, become rigid. And so it stretches up to a certain size and they usually inflate themselves bigger than they actually are so that when they harden their new cuticle, they've got room to grow. And then they deflate a little bit and then they've, they've got, um, They've got a new exoskeleton that is a little bit more roomy than the old one. And they've cracked off the old one 
and shed and they just have to climb out of it. Um, some of you uh, in areas where you've had cicadas, you've seen cicada, um, little husks of uh, cicada exoskeletons hanging on tree trunks. And uh, those are the uh, shed exoskeleton of the cicada after it climbs up out of the ground and does its last shed and then climbs up into the trees and becomes a, a, a very loud and noisy cicada. This, uh, again, is an insect that shows no metamorphosis. They keep getting bigger, but there's no real apparent change in body form um, during these immature stages. This last molt to an adult, the only difference here is that it's sexually mature, whereas these are immatures. Okay, the next kind, incomplete metamorphosis, um, the egg hatches into what is called a nymph. Okay, a nymph. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, get, I don't have my mouse and I've, I'm limited without my mouse because I can't use the pointer function. So I'm going to get this. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so here they hatch uh, into a little nymph, and and then when it needs to molt, it molds it into a bigger nymph and a bigger nymph and a bigger nymph and a bigger nymph, and then it does a little bit bigger change, although not a radical change into the adult. Um, it molts and uh, the main difference, anybody see the main difference uh, between nymphs and the adults? They don't call these nymphs, they just call these larvae or immatures. They look pretty much like the adult except smaller. But here they call these nymphs um, N-Y-M-P-H, nymph. Okay, what's the difference between nymphs and the adult? That's obvious. Wing. Wings. Wings. Here you can see wing pads, and when they molt, um, they pull their, their um, adult body out of this um, exoskeleton, and the wings, the adult wings, are stuffed inside these wing pads, um, kind of like mummy bags in your... Um, you know, mummy bags inside that stuff bag for your, your sleeping bags. They pull their new wings out of these little wing pads and then they inflate them by pumping blood up into the veins of these wings and then everything hardens. That's incomplete metamorphosis. Complete metamorphosis is something we're familiar with. You've learned in grade school where um, the egg hatches into what we call a larva Okay, these are nymphs in incomplete metamorphosis. Here it's called a larva, and it molts into a bigger larva and then a bigger larva, uh, and then it undergoes a complete wholesale transformation. Uh, this is complete metamorphosis. It molts into a pupa, and basically a pupa, everything liquefies. It's like gutting a whole house, and all of the tissues are essentially destroyed and re, uh, remade into a completely different body plan from a larva to a, uh, an adult. And the adult really has no resemblance to the, uh, the larva or the pupa for that matter. Now in different insect groups you'll call larvas uh, the larvae different things like in butterflies you call the larvae caterpillars, and you can call the pupa a chrysalis, um, and then the adult, the butterfly, okay? But uh, butterflies, or Lepidoptera, which we learn, uh, aren't the only, um, are not the only uh, order that does complete metamorphosis. We've got a number of other ones, and we'll see that in a bit. Okay, 
Next. I have a question, Rachel. Sure, Rachel. Um, so in the first one, the, where there's no metamorphosis, yeah. um, did you say that the stage right after egg is called larva? Because it doesn't well, really you could, usually they just say immature, but it's, lar it's a larva too. You can say either. I would say most entomologists on incomplete metamorphosis will just say immature. And then with the incomplete nymph and with complete um, larva. Okay, um, odonata. And I, I don't have a whole lot of characteristics. I just have mostly pictures. I don't have them bullet pointed. But we talked about these in lab. So this is sort of um, uh, your second coat on the information. Um, the major orders of insects, as I mentioned before, uh, there's about 30 orders and we're only learning seven. Okay, so uh, order Odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies. There's roughly around 5,500 species. Uh, here on the left are damselflies and here is a dragonfly. Uh, those of you who want to see a real one, There's a dragonfly. And again, they hold their wings out uh, perpendicular to the body. Uh, damselflies um, don't usually hold them out like this. They uh, bring them together, but they wind up going sort of backwards because their whole thorax is on such an angle that when they when they um, put them back, it, it does orient the wings up over their abdomen generally. But they don't necessarily have a uh, hinge mechanism. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about those hinge mechanisms that are in other uh, insect orders. Um, a hinge mechanism would be if a dragonfly could swing, when they're not flying, if the dragonfly could swing their um, uh, swing their wings back over their abdomen. Okay, here uh, shows you that the dragonfly order or the odonata are incomplete metamorphosis. You might think this is almost complete metamorphosis. Um, they lay their eggs in the water and when they hatch out, um, these are completely aquatic. Um, this is just the um, a, a nymph of a dragonfly and it crawls. I've got actually a, um, a box of, uh, here we go. Here's a dragonfly. It's a dragonfly in a vial. Uh, you would never think it's a dragonfly because you don't see wings and it's got wing pads there. Um, and it crawls around underwater and is an underwater predator, just uh, like the adults are aerial predators. Um, they've got an amazing bit of uh, mouth parts where um, their mouth parts are hinged and actually have an elbow in it. And when they come up to a prey item, their, their mouth parts swing out like, a, um, like an arm punching. And when it swings out, it grabs the prey and pulls it back to the mouth. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible lower lip, um, where your lower lip can swing out, grab the food, and bring it back. That's what they do, but this is a top view, so you can't see this amazing lower lip that uh, grabs prey. Uh, when it's ready to, when it goes through several larv um, nymphal stages, it finally molts into an adult, so it has to crawl out of the water and climb up on a rush on the side of a pond or a, a stream. And here, here's a dragonfly that's pulled its body out of its uh, cuticle, kind of like a cicada, 
It's all white because before they've hardened their exoskeleton, their exoskeleton is very, very white or cream colored. And um, these big wings here were stuffed inside uh, these little wing pads. And then they inflate, they pump blood through them and um, harden up. Okay, so uh, that is their uh, incomplete metamorphosis for uh, Odonata. Orthoptera, actually, let me go back. Um, I didn't mention their um, reproduction, but it's pretty incredible. Uh, these damselflies here are mating and it's uh, quite, quite complicated. Before the female, this right here is the, the female. Before the female arrives, the male um, deposits his own sperm from the tip of the abdomen and puts the sperm in a compartment up here in the second abdominal segment. So the sperm is deposited up here on himself. And then he flies, gets a female, grabs the female by the neck with little pinching like Circe, um, grabs her by the neck and then uh, she bends her abdomen forward and then uh, places her abdomen up against his uh, abdomen close to the thorax and then takes the sperm on board. And then once she's fertilized her eggs, uh, she can then deposit them in whatever aquatic habitat um, she, she's, um, whatever habitat she lives in. Okay, some live uh, more in lakes, some in streams, some in ponds. And dragonflies do a very similar uh, pretty much the same kind of courtship and coupling. Okay, next, uh, Orthoptera. As I said, Orthoptera are the straight wing, and these are the grasshoppers and crickets. It's a bigger order, 20,000 species. Uh, here we've got a longhorn grasshopper. Um, here is a very big Costa Rican grasshopper. Um, it's probably about that long. And um, you can see these, uh, you know, orthoptera meaning straight wing. Uh, four wings are called tegmina. That's plural. I said in lab it was tegmin. Tegmin is singular, tegmina is plural. Um, here, are the teg here is a tegmin right here. And just looking at the body parts, you've got the head, the pro what? That's the prothorax. That's the prothoracic legs and the mesothoracic leg. And then the very big jumping metathoracic leg. Here is a banded wing grasshopper with the uh, um, wings, um, at least the right wings laid out. So we have the tegmin here, which is a wing cover, and it's, uh, it's the forewing or the mesothoracic wing. And then the, the wing that's for flight is the metathoracic wing. All this is review, uh, it's to get it all pounded in. Um, some grasshoppers don't, um, even the adults, uh, don't have wings. And you, you, at first you might think, well, these must be immatures, these must be nymphs, uh, but they, um, they are reproductive. And so the only way you know is the fact that they mate and lay, uh, they lay eggs. Uh, often the females will have a big sword-like uh, almost looks like a samurai sword sticking out the rear. Uh, and when you see that sword, you know it's an adult, uh, even if there are no wings. 
Um, so, Orthoptera. This also includes the katydids, for those of you in uh, back east. I should have put another bullet point here, uh, big jumping hind legs or large saltatorial metathoracic appendages, to be technical. Um, we have here um, the next order is Hemiptera, which means half wing. These are the true bugs, um, 35,000 species. That's probably going uh, up every year. It keeps climbing because uh, they keep discovering new species every time they uh, collect in the tropical rainforest. Um, these, are the, these are the half wing insects. And here is a, a representative bug for you uh, from the a dorsal view. They've got the head, then the prothorax, then the triangle. You'll usually see a nice clear triangle. And then um, the triangle is the meso, at least the part of the mesothorax that is visible. And the hemilytra, the four wings, which are sprouting out of the mesothorax, um, come back uh, and cover the rest of the body over the first part of the four wings. Oh, I'm going to use a word for, from human anatomy. The, what would this be compared to this? Proximal or distal? Distal. Oh, this is distal. Distal is the farther out on the wing or appendage. So the distal part of the wing is membranous and the proximal part of the wing is leathery. And they fit together really nicely, um, very geometrically. So the inner border is running right along that triangle, then they kind of meet together here, and then the, the membranous part here. The membranous parts overlap, whereas the leathery parts do not overlap. Um, this is the giant water bug, the gruesome giant water bug that is stabbing um, a frog. And um, here it's got these large uh, forelegs or prothoracic legs that pinion the frog. And uh, then they stick their piercing, sucking mouth parts in um, and liquefy the prey. Now, there are plant eaters and um, predators. So, um, like here's a, a predatory bug with piercing, sucking mouth parts extended into the caterpillar. Um, here, eating a frog. But here, uh, this harlequin bug, um, again with a hemi, really beautiful hemilytra and triangular um, mesothorax. And here's the prothorax and then the head. Okay, this would be a plant eater, and it sticks its beak, uh, or yeah, its piercing, sucking mouth parts into plant tissue and sucks up either plant juices or some of them are called seed bugs, and they stick their beak down into a seed and then um, inject some saliva to liquefy some of the contents of the seed and suck it up. So. Plant eaters, predators, you name it. Um, next, Coleoptera. Uh, coleo means sheath, wing. Coleo means sheath and terra means wing. So these are the sheath wings and um, the four wings are the sheaths. Um, they are called elytra. And the elytra are very, uh, well, the elytra are clearly different from the hemilytra. Remember the hemilytra overlap here. Um, 
and we don't have a, well, we have sometimes a, a straight seam here, but then that's, that's where the straight seam ends, then they overlap. Where in the beetle, oops, um, the, the elytra, not hemelytra, the elytra have a straight seam all the way back, and these are the wing covers, elytra. They do not have piercing, sucking mouth parts. They have mandibles that swing this way, and they chew their food. Um, I, I mentioned the ladybird beetles. Um, a lot of people call them ladybugs, but they are truly beetles, and they have classic elytra, big orange elytra with dots on them. Then you've got the pro prothorax, and then the head. Here is a firefly, but it's not a fly, it's a beetle. And if you flip this over, uh, here's the light organ. Um, you'll flip this over and you'll see that it's got true elytra. This is just a smattering of some beetles, but 350,000 species. We'd be here all day scrolling through beetles. Um, uh, but they're out of the 350,000 species, uh, s some are, um, there's probably 160 families, uh, and of those families, sometimes there's hundreds, if not thousands, of species. Um, this right here is the biggest family of beetles, um, and this family here, um, are the weevils. You've heard of uh, cotton boll weevils. Um, they've got a really cute snout. Um, almost looks like an elephant. Um, but some of them have, have very short snouts that look like a dog. Um, and some very, very short, like a bulldog. But they do have snouts and they have their antennae sprouting off their snout. And you think they have piercing sucking. No, they don't have piercing sucking mouth parts. They have little mandibles fixed on the end of their snout and they chew. Okay. And this one, the stag beetle, has really, really big mandibles. Um, uh, others have just nor normal size mandibles. And they range from predators to plant eaters, you name it. 350. 350,000 species, you're going to have a lot of variety. Here is a beetle I caught up on Tomer Butte, just southeast of town. Um, big old beetle, about, oh, about that long. And um, its elytra are so uh, perfectly meshed toge together, you can't even see the seam in between. But this is not, the way you know the abdomen, this is a clear example of how teachers would say head, children, head, thorax, abdomen. Wrong. Head, prothorax, elytra. Where's the abdomen? Well, it's got to be after the hind legs. So the hind legs are coming off of the metathorax. So the abdomen has got to be say from about here back. Got that? From about here back is the abdomen. And the only way you can see that is by looking on its belly and see everything after the hind legs is abdomen. This is covering over both the meso and the meta thorax as well as the abdomen. Hey Gordon, would you mind muting one of our visitors, Michael Jones? I think he's left his mic on. Okay, let's see here, stop share, um, I'm trying to find, all right, and go, Perfect. Thank you. you bet, and share, the next Okay, so going back, um, 
to the Beatles. Uh, well, going back to the bugs, these guys, I should mention, these guys are incomplete metamorphosis, so they have nymphs. Um, these are complete metamorphosis. Uh, when you see a baby beetle, it's not going to look like a beetle. It's going to be a grub. So have you ever seen a thing that looks like a pasty white caterpillar underground? That's not a caterpillar. It might be a, a beetle grub. They don't look anything like beetles. Some people think, oh, I see a little tiny beetle. It must be a baby beetle. If it looks like a beetle, it's not a baby. It can be a millimeter long. And if, it's a, if it looks like a beetle, it's an adult. Okay? Baby beetles are grubs. Pasty white, usually. Um, Diptera. These are the two-winged insects. They're the flies. And we have your typical flies, like this house fly, but you've got all sorts of other flies, like this uh, crane fly, uh, which is often fluttering around your porch um, of your house. Uh, and they look like enormous mosquitoes. And some people call them mosquito hawks, but no, they are not mosquito hawks. They are crane flies. And it just uh, mosquito hawks is a misnomer because they don't eat mosquitoes. They don't, they, they hardly eat at all. Some maybe eat some nectar pollen, but um, they, they don't suck a quarter blood uh, from you or anything like that. Um, anyway, uh, house flies, crane flies, here's a horse fly, um, here's a, another kind of fly, I'm not sure what this is. Um, and then they are complete metamorphosis too. Um, we usually call fly larvae um, maggots. So beetle larvae you call grubs, fly larvae you call maggots, and uh, la butterfly larvae you call caterpillars. Um, the, the hallmark feature of these guys is hind wings are modified into gyroscopic organs called halteres. And you can see, um, well, you can't see very well here. I'll show you uh, on the next page. Here we go. This is a hoverfly. Uh, often hoverflies look a bit like yellow jackets because they can be black and white banded. And uh, it's really nice to have some entomology because you can look at a hoverfly and go, um, as it's hovering around you during a picnic, everybody else is having a cow and flipping picnic baskets over, thinking it's a yellow jacket. And you can just relax, twiddle your thumbs, and go, that's a hoverfly. Because it looks like a fly, doggone it. Um, it doesn't have any waspy features other than the general color. So you got to look at um, the, um, the fly gestalt. Two wings on the mesothorax. These are the flight wings and the halteres right here. And here, little club-shaped uh, gyroscopic organs that help it maintain balance in flight. All flies have it. It's just some are fuzzier and uh, you can't see the halteres very clearly, uh, or they've got some other structures down in here that kind of block your view of the halteres. Okay, um, any questions? So we're just doing this 30,000 foot overview of these orders. Um, we can't get into the cool details as much, just the main features. Uh, Lepidoptera. This means scale wing insects. And these are the butterflies and moths. This is a pretty big order. Um, not, not as big as the beetles. It's about half the size as beetles, but still very big. And um, we've got uh, the hallmark feature is that they've got these uh, microscopic scales 
all over their wings. I zoomed in in lab to uh, one spot here on this butterfly wing, and you can see this, this spot is made of all these different color scales. You could almost say that the scales are like pixels in a, um, in a digital print. Um, and so all of the different color patterns are due to the scales and the colors of those scales. And the scales are actually part of their cuticle, but they are made in such a way as very detachable um, so that when you actually hold a butterfly, the scales come right off and leave dust on your fingers. Uh, siphoning mouth parts. Um, right here you see this uh, butterfly unrolling its straw-like mouth parts and sucking up nectar. And that's one thing they all pretty much share is um, they siphon nectar. There are some that will, if you've ever had butterflies land on your um, skin and uh, lick the salty sweat, have you ever had that? Anybody? Nope. nope. I, I've seen some butterflies that, that like the salt and they'll land on your skin and lick that. Um, there is one uh, blood feeding butterfly or moth uh, in South America, but that's sort of the exception to the rule. Complete metamorphosis, caterpillars, okay? The egg, Larva, uh, egg, caterpillar, caterpillar, and keep getting bigger until finally they become a pupa or a chrysalis, and then um, the butterfly. Dr. Wilson, just a question. Sure. Um, those moths that look kind of furry, are those actually moths? Are those scales? I, I don't know what they're called, but you know the furry moths? Oh, yeah, the furry moths. Those um, that look like fur, yeah, they are just really long scales that look more like fur. Yep. Um, and so this is actually, these big furry moths are called the giant um, silkworm moth. Giant silkworm moth. And you've got cecropia moths. You've got, there's a bunch... It's really hard, if you, if you want to stay humble, go into entomology, because uh, entomology is so vast, it's, it's impossible to even feel like you've got a handle on it, uh, because there's just so many species. It's ridiculous. Um, when I first uh, took, um, when I had my, uh, one of my graduate's classes in entomology was called Insect ID. And we studied, in that one class, we studied 200 families. And that was only one, um, that was one third of the families in North America. We didn't even go below family. And each family would be like, hundreds to thousands of species, like weevils. We just learn the family and learn the characteristics of the family, never mind the 60,000 species in that stupid family, okay? Um, ridiculous kinds of diversity. And it's great, it's uh, wonderful. It uh, keeps you humble. Okay, Hymenoptera. Um, this means membrane wing, and they are actually going to fly with all four wings, but their wings are pretty narrow and sporty, uh, if they have wings. Um, got, here's a, a bee, I gotta see myself, so I'm, um, Let's see, how am I? Oh, well. Uh, do you see that? 
Okay, I see myself now. Uh, there's a B, and uh, you can kind of see that the wings, actually in this B, the wings are, the wings are actually together, okay? And as I said in lab, the uh, hind wings are hooked to the fore wings by little microscopic hooks. This is a really nice uh, close-up picture. Um, these hooks come out of the very front edge of the hind wing, and they are pointing forward and hook over the the last vein on the front wing. So they're essentially coupled together. So here is a front wing, here is the hind wing, and these little hooks are called hamuli. And they essentially couple the wings together so they act as one, sort of act like one wing instead of two. Okay, these have complete metamorphosis. So you would just call these, uh, they don't, um, I don't know if any of you are beekeepers, but um, often you say brood, um, they're, the, they're larvae. I don't know if they have a special name. Does anyone know, any call them grubs or anything like that? I don't think they call them grubs. Um, Dr. Rossi? Yeah. What's the benefit of having a hooked wing? Well, it, cut, it keeps the wings together so that they can get more power in flight so that they're not beating. But there's actually advantages to having them beat um, asynchronously, like the dragonflies. The dragonflies, um, if you see them fly, the front wings can be at a different, um, are not beating in sync with the back wings. So whether they're hooked and acting like one wing or separate, uh, there's advantages to either. I think that these are uh, just neat little, I don't know what would happen if you uh, unhook these and whether they could fly very well or not. Uh, but it's, a, it's really cool when you see the uh, electron micrograph picture of them, the exquisite detail of these hooks, but they're just, you can't really see them with the naked eye. Okay, um, how am I doing on time? I don't have a, okay, oh, I've got lots of time. Any questions about uh, insects before we move on? There's so much uh, to know. Um, lots of good field guides. Um, if you want recommends for insect field guides for the Pacific Northwest, um, I've got some good recommendations. Um, we're just barely getting, we're just barely scraping the surface here. Yeah. Specifically related to like a, a specific example here, but I've just been curious, like this whole term, how do taxonomists possibly keep track with any level of consistency all of these phylums and subphylums and species, especially with the insects where there's just so many of them and so many being discovered each day? Yeah, how's that, it's how's that it, even possible? it's it's rough. They do have organizations that like international. Um, I forget what it's called, but there's a international organization for uh, taxonomic nomenclature. And so there is not always consensus. Um, there's often very uh, vitriolic um, battles um, of, amongst taxonomists. It, although there are real groupings, 
you can see these are real groupings like damselflies, dragonflies, but it's sort of um, arbitrary on whether you want to call it a, um, a suborder or, I mean, it's just, you could call it, it's one year I'm, I'm calling Orthoptera, like when I was going through Orthoptera um, was just grasshoppers and crickets. But earlier, um, some taxonomists tend to lump and um, make more inclusive larger groupings. And so uh, in the old days, Orthoptera was um, grasshoppers, crickets, cockroaches, and um, praying mantises. But then the splitters, you can, you've got usually two types of taxonomists, splitters and lumpers. And the splitters uh, have had their way and split out the grasshoppers and crickets as orthoptera, sensu strictu. Uh, and then the others, like the praying mantises and the cockroaches, had their own order. So, you know, there are, you know, there is battles, and who's got the most ethos wins. And somebody, sometimes, uh, one textbook says one thing and another textbook says another thing, and the authors of those two textbooks hate each other because they are, in <laughs> they're trying to be the, the authority on it. And the other biologists say, you listen, taxonomy, whether you promote or demote um, things, the organism doesn't evolve. The taxonomy does. Uh, a lot, the taxonomy uh, evolves a lot faster than the creatures certainly do. Um, okay, so I hope that sort of tells you how muddy it is. Um, we're still in arthropods, so we've done, um, you know, millipedes and centipedes, uh, and then we've uh, done crustaceans. Um, we've done, you know, insects. Now uh, another subphylum, uh, Chelicerata. We're still in Arthropoda. Um, Chelicerata are chelicerates, and they do not have antennae. All the others do. Insects have antennae. Crustaceans have two pairs of antennae. Uh, millipedes and centipedes have antennae, but these guys do not. Um, these include the weirdos called horseshoe crabs, and they're not crustaceans because they don't have any, any antennae. But they do live in the ocean. And uh, if you want to, when we go back to normal here, I've got a big cooler with an enormous uh, horseshoe crab uh, pickled in uh, formalin. If you want to see my horseshoe crab. Uh, here's a baby horseshoe crab. Uh, you've got the uh, you've got the cephalothorax here and the abdomen. And you've got this ten telson. Don't, don't worry about the anatomy. They have uh, they have eight legs and then um, well on this one I'm not going to confuse you I'm just going to call them horseshoe crabs, class Merostomata, and uh, they feed on worms and small mollusks in the intertidal zone. Um, they have these little pincher-like uh, things called chelicery up front, and those chelicery grab the food, and their mouth is right here, which is weird. Right in between all their legs, they've got their mouth. Okay, and that's all I want you to know um, about horseshoe crabs. If you flip them over the top side, no antennae, but they do have compound eyes right here, separated by quite a distance. One eye, the other eye. Arachnids. Guess what these are? These are chelicerates as well. So Meristomata, chelicerates. They've got chelicery, um, 
petty palps, called the next pair of appendages, chelicerae, petty palps, and four pair of walking legs. Okay, next, arachnids. Now, I have a spider here, but arachnids include a lot more than spiders. They've got chelicerae with fangs. You can see uh, on a spider it, right up front, they've got these more vertically oriented chelicerae, and on the tips of the chelicerae are mounted fangs, which grab, um, stab their food, and uh, liquefy their prey and suck up the juice. They always eat liquid food. Their petty palps means feeler, uh, I'm sorry, leg feelers are, they look like short little legs. So right here on the uh, spider here, you've got the chelicerae right up front and in the middle. Then you've got the petty palps right here that look like short legs, and then you've got four pair of walking legs. All of them are mounted on the what? Any guesses? Prothorax. Cephalothorax, right here. Kind of like crustaceans, the same word, cephalothorax means head thorax, cephalothorax. Does that make sense? So they don't have a head, thorax, and abdomen. They have a cephalothorax and abdomen. Um, so that's sort of the layout of an arachnid. Um, and I think they, the evolutionists are trying to shoehorn this into the same basic subphylum by calling these chelicerae, these pedipalps, and these walking legs. I think that's a stretch because a lot of these look very much the same. I think they just want to make them related. Um, they're very, very different. Okay, the class Arachnida. You really have to, um, you know, get your sheet, your outline of life, and I really, really can't emphasize it enough to memorize that thing so you get this nice filing system in your head. Um, and it is useful other than just doing well in my class. Uh, if you've got the filing system in your head, you see some creature, you can at least categorize it at, at some level. Like you can at least put it in class or maybe order. And then once you can get it somewhat um, pigeonholed into a particular taxon of which kingdom phylum class order whatever it is if you can pigeonhole it into that you have a much better chance of looking it up most people don't bother looking it up because they have no idea on earth what it is and so they just don't bother trying to find out about it but if you can at least classify it to order or phylum or something, then you can go on the web and look things up and, and get a, a, a shot at trying to figure out something about it. Naming is important because it's like your card catalog or a catalog system of the library. A collection of books is not a library. It has to be all cataloged. Um, if, we, if we don't catalog it, we can't find the book we're looking for. But if you've got a system, you can pull up that book, you know, by author or by title. But if you don't have author or title or anything like that, there's no way to pull it up. So a classification is the same thing. It allows you, it's information storage and retrieval of all, all the creatures that are out there. And there are a lot more of them than books. Well, maybe not. Um, Dr. Wilson? Yeah, Annalisa. Um, when you were talking about the different types of taxonomists, is it evolutionists who tend to be the stuffers? Uh, not necessarily, because all of them are, the lumpers and splinters, the lumpers and splitters are both evolutionists. 
It's just really the lumpers tend to look at similarities and the splitters tend to look at differences. Okay, we're on class Arachnida here. And so uh, the first order is Opiliones. Uh, we're only doing just a few orders, like in um, Insecta, class Insecta, we did seven orders. Here, Arachnida, we're doing four, I believe, or maybe more. Um, Opiliones are the daddy long legs or harvest men. And um, they are arachnids, but they are not spiders, okay? And the one way you can tell um, a daddy long leg is that spiders, um, remember spiders have a waist of sorts between their cephalothorax and their abdomen. Uh, this looks like it's all sort of one, and their, their cephalothorax is broadly joined to their abdomen, so it all looks like sort of one oval lump. And as far as I'm concerned, it makes them look less creepy. Um, some of you have heard this old wives' tale, and I bet you a bunch of you believe it. What's the wives' tale I'm referring to? Deadly venom in the world. Yeah, that's a bunch of bunk. <laughs> they don't have venom. Uh, they are a very feeble predator and they hardly even, uh, they may have a little bit of saliva to take down their own little feeble prey, but um, yes, it's not the most potent venom in the world and it's not really venom. But what they people say is that it's the most deadly venom, but they just can't get 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 it into you. Well, it's uh, yeah, it can't get it into you, but it's not deadly at all. Um, they are weak little feeble predators and scavengers um, that wander around your foliage and on the ground, and um, I think their creep coefficient is pretty low. Um, very lanky, but with that fat waist, they just don't creep me out. At least that's me. Uh, order Akari, uh, that, that can creep people out. These are the ticks and mites. Um, they also have a, you know, the same kind of thing. They've got chelicerae, just like Opiliones. Chelicerae, pedipalps, four pairs of walking legs. Uh, ticks, same thing. Uh, here's a tick, uh, here's the, um, up here, um, sort of all put together, but they've got pe uh, chelicerae and pedipalps, and they drill the chelicerae into you and uh, anchor themselves and then suck, suck your blood or your dog's blood or, your, or deer blood or whatever mammal they're trying to suck blood from. Um, this is a big order, and there are uh, whole areas of research devoted to this because um, these guys vector a lot of diseases of agricultural animals as well as um, people like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, Lyme disease, and, and such. So these can be a big health problem, but... but um, there you go. This is a distended tick where it's sucked blood and it's got sort of expandex exoskeleton um, and it's got this very hugely engorged uh, abdomen and actually part of its cephalothorax here because the legs are connected to the cephalothorax. This right here shows you the abdomen which is lighter, and then this part here is the cephalothorax. And the walking legs are hooked to the cephalothorax. Dr. Wilson? Yeah. Do ticks have any other ways of feeding themselves besides blood? Um, it's only the females um, that drink your blood because they need them for um, making eggs 
So I don't know what the males eat, uh, but it's kind of like mosquitoes. Female mosquitoes suck your blood, males drink nectar. I'm not making any generalizations on that. Um, another, so that's uh, order Opiliones, Akari. Um, actually, there is um, the dis there are people that just study the ticks and mites, and they're called acarologists. Um, and it's a, it's a big, big discipline with a lot of um, biologists that are acarologists. Not too many, new, not <laughs> mostly because there's a, a huge economic and biomedical importance here, not, not any importance, so there's not too many people studying daddy long legs sort of an esoteric um, thing that, okay, order Scorpiones, pretty easy order to remember because it sounds pretty much just like scorpions with a ES on the end. Um, this is, um, although they superficially look like a, a crayfish, they are not a crustacean. They are uh, an arachnid. And one of the ways you can, is they're a chelicerate. No antennae. You'll never see antennae on these guys. Uh, up front, in the middle, they've got uh, chelicerate. And then these, these big pinchers that they brandish out to the sides are the pedipalps. Um, now, if you look closely at the... Um, the scorpion, you would think that maybe the skinny part's the abdomen. But if you look closely here at this scorpion, um, this last, this leg right here is hooked here. You notice from here to here, that's sort of all one unit. So from here to here is the what? Cephalothorax. That's the cephalothorax. And then after that back leg, whatever's behind that back leg is abdomen. This, there's a thick part of the abdomen, which is called the pre-abdomen. And then the skinny part is the post-abdomen. Pre and post-abdomen. And then you've got this stinging, uh, the stinger on the end, um, which has got venom glands and nice little ducts running to the tip. And Scorpions range in how potent their venom. Some, they just sting like a bee. Others are pretty deadly. Um, so it ranges. You've got 1,500 or so species, um, some quite, quite small. Let me see if I've got... No, I think my scorpions are up there. Oh well, I've got a few scorpions in my vials. Um, there are some scorpions close to Moscow, but not in Moscow. You can go down to Lewiston and you can um, find a few scorpions under rocks and things. Uh, one time I uh, was looking, of course, for reptiles and amphibians, and I flipped a rock down uh, in the valley near Clarkston, and uh, under the rock was a bunch of termites. Maybe it was a, a log. Anyway, I flipped it, and there's a bunch of termites and a scorpion sort of in the middle of them. Um, and it was the funniest thing, because this little scorpion, which was about, oh, about that long, uh, sort of uh, amber color, and it had it had a bunch of termites in its claws, just, <laughs> and it had a bunch of termites stuffed in its mouth, and it was just pigging out um, on termites. Uh, it just looked very gluttonous, and I left him 
alone after that. This termite, I'm sorry, this scorpion here I found um, down in southern Idaho, south of Boise, which was quite a bit bigger. That, that one was about this long. Okay. Uh, last but not least of the arachnids is order Aranea. Now, I know you would say, oh, man, you pronounce that all goofy. Uh, because you, your Latin, you probably would say Arenii or Arenii. Anyway, um, I asked a spider biologist um, who was teaching at Lynchburg College. His license plate had that word on it. Um, and I said, well, how do you say that word anyway? And he said, Arenea. So... That's what happens when scientists aren't trained in the classics. They just come up with their own pronunciation. So 40,000 species thereabouts. That was one fact that they got right in Spider-Man. They are all predators except for one. There's actually an exception to that rule. There are, um, down in South and Central America, there's a spider, jumping spider, that actually eats plant material. It's not completely plant, it's not a complete plant eater, but it is, it eats, you know, the majority of its diet is plant material. It's pretty cool. But up till they discovered that spider, uh, they thought they were all predators. Um, they have some really incredible uh, silk spinning abilities and the spinnerets that we saw with um, Shelob and Lord of the Rings wrapping up Frodo. Um, and that's sort of how they do it. Um, they, they really did that well as far as the spinnerets. Now the spinnerets are very, very incredibly um, complicated because they've got lots of little spigots that will make different kinds of silk. Um, they've got different silk glands inside their abdomen. So they'll, they'll use some silk, certain kinds of silk to line their nest, uh, certain kinds of silk to wrap their eggs, certain kinds of silk to wrap their prey with, other silk to make their, like on their web, if they are an orb web spider, uh, some, some silk strands are sticky and some silk strands are not sticky. And they walk on the non-sticky ones. Um, it's so incredibly complex. If you watch, we're sort of used to webs that we just go, oh, gross, if you run into a web when you're hiking. You just go, oh, it's gross. But if you look at the complexity of, and often they'll rip down the web every night and build a new one the you know, following day. Um, that's a lot of work to tear it down and build another one. And they'll, they'll often recycle the web. They'll, they'll eat that material and recycle the silk. Um, uh, I wrote an article about um, in answers on this, so if, if you want to read that, that would be uh, good. It's called Masters of Web Design what, or something like that. Okay, lots of different kinds of spiders, lots of different families. Um, and you've got the Petty palps, I'm sorry, petty palps, chelicerae, right there. Uh, all of this is on the cephalothorax. Cephalothorax abdomen. Okay? So basically, get down the main features of these, be able to recognize the main features in any general natural history I've mentioned. Okay, um, wrapped it up just in time. So um, for, for my class, 
you are all dismissed and I can um, stick around for the prospective students. If they have any questions, they can unmute themselves. But the rest of you guys, you can leave or, or stay if you want. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll see you. Bye.